This interview is being conducted at the World War I Veterans of the USA Convention in Oklahoma City, uh, 27th of August, 1988. I'm Dr. James Williams, and I'm here uh, interviewing one of the veterans of World War I. Uh, this interview is open to access to all, and, and this is with Mr. Joseph E. Walsh. Uh, Mr. Walsh, would you just uh, tell him what, how is it that you got into the, to the service to start with? That's okay. It'll pick up. I was a young boy, lost my mother, living with my sister. We got the horrendous news that our country was going into war. I immediately went in and uh, volunteered my services, and I was accepted. But they had no clothes for me. In fact, they lacked so many things that uh, they sent me home for almost a month until they had the clothes to outfit us. And then the clothes that I got was uh, somewhat fit a big man, a heavy built man, and others would be, uh, so we swapped among ourselves till we got the right size shoes and the right size uh, clothes. And the uh, uniforms, of course, were made quick and they were kind of shoddy, but uh, I enlisted at the, uh, what was then Camp Jackson, at the um, Boston Navy Yard. And they sent us, sent us home uh, to wait until call for call. So I got, I got no credit for the uh, uh, first. They didn't really uh, sign me up, so I lost all, my, all the time waiting for calls. Then eventually uh, the ship was uh, under repair. It had been one of the uh, ships that had been decommissioned. But on account of the war, they brought it back in and uh, we finally were assigned to uh, convoy duty. It took us south of uh, France, down around through Brest on one trip, up into the North uh, Sea on another trip. We'd pick up from one, one, one to 25 uh, people, uh, ships rather, and uh, they'd go wherever they were assigned to go and uh, destroy us from the, uh, from France, or uh, they'd come and pick them up and escort them into their uh, uh, whatever ports they were going. Some of these ships were going up to uh, Archangel and Murmansk. Well, we get the order to come right back because another convoy was being uh, put together. And as soon as we get back to the States, we'd recall and uh, it was very cold for fuel. And we'd just start and go uh, on another convoy trip. We'd done quite a few of these uh, trips. Some, sometimes the ocean was nice and peaceful and other times it, wasn't, it was angry. And uh, that was one of the events, and in between, they squeezed us into a, a search division to go down into the uh, Caribbean. The, uh, sub, uh, the boats were uh, sinking our oil, oiling ships, and uh, we, got, we got notice that a submarine was working up off of uh, uh, Provincetown, sinking the, the fishing vessels. And we come back from uh, down in the Caribbean under four strap. That meant uh, being a fireman, I made first class. That was you took care of three doors. And uh, being only a young fellow, it, it was it was quite a heavy tour, uh, job. But uh, we come back to Boston, and then we found we found out that the cap uh, the captain of the submarine uh, wrote a uh, letter to the War Department telling them that. He had gone to the moving picture, named the moving picture in Provincetown, and how many ships he had sunk. And then, of course, he possibly get out of the area. There was 27 of our ships, and we run into a hurricane, and every one of the ships sustained, uh, well, from minor to major uh, trouble. The Michigan lost a four mass and nine men off the bridge. And uh, it was, we didn't realize it, but we were in a very, very severe, Hurricane off the off the shores of uh, at Cape Hatteras, known as the uh, Graveyard of Ships. There's there's where this all occurred, and they all made they all were all crippled more or less. They made into Philadelphia and into New York or wherever they could go, and uh, our our ship sustained uh, plate damage. That is the rivets and that were popped, 
And we, uh, they used the mattresses and they used the uh, collision mats and everything like that. We got in to, back to Boston. And uh, I then become an engineer. I went out in the engine, engineer's course. But my training was, uh, I had gone through uh, Votech school as they know them now. And I had taken up woodworking and such. So they transferred me then into what is known as the Artisifers branch. The war was uh, declared over. We were coming back into New York. And uh, at that time, Josephus Daniels was the Secretary of the Navy. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the assistant. And they pulled up in between the two lines of ships, uh, Swedish ships. Each one played the uh, Star Spangled Banner, and then they all played their case. That, uh, uh, well, they, as they know it now, the pres presidential yacht uh, went up. They all had the crews on deck, and they all played the national anthem and, and their own, and dipped the flags. A very, very nice ritual. Uh, they transferred so many of us fellows that they could dispense with, and they put bunks. Uh, Three-tier bunks took the guns out and everything to bring the boys back from uh, uh, Europe, and uh, I was assigned out to with about uh, 1,800 or more people from Norfolk by train up in through Indiana and up in through and finally we got down from Windsor, Canada, into Detroit, and uh, we finished up at the Great Lakes just at the time when they were having that giant epidemic of uh, what they call Spanish flu. They were dying out there, I think, in the final summation at the Great Lakes, they lost, they figured, around 100,000 men. Well, there was a, I'm looking for a soft job, naturally. So I uh, had worked in a store as a boy, and the fellow that was in charge of the 20 ship stores at the Great Lakes, I went to him and he came from Massachusetts. He was a full, uh, uh, full lieutenant, two stripes. And I told him that I was, uh, you tell white lies. So he said to me, I have an opening over at the uh, main hospital camp. Fellas leaving to go to Oklahoma City. And uh, I went in there and I stayed with that until I was sent back to Boston. And uh, it was, it was, Difficult at times, but very, very pleasant at other times. So, uh, from that, uh, I have two sons that uh, became, one was with Patton in World War II, made Omaha Beach, and he finished as a major with a step up at retirement to Lieutenant Colonel. And my other boy was too young, but he went through the National Guard, and he became a full colonel and state provost marshal uh, in Massachusetts, and he still, uh, the older boy that was with Patton, uh, he has retired, and uh, the other boy is still in the service. But now uh, they tell me that they're splitting the National Guard up, lack, to, lack of uh, uh, members, you know, and uh, they cut the, they cut the, uh, numerical strength of the National Guard in Boston down to, to 8, uh, 8,000. And if they can't maintain that 8,000, they're going to split it again, and one half, they tell me, will go out to Denver, Colorado. And Massachusetts might be without National Guard. Let me ask a couple of questions about uh, things you had mentioned when we had been talking earlier. Uh, first of all, how old were you when you went into the service? Seventeen. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but I took my brother's age, and being an Irish uh, outfit up and around Boston, so that if they asked me a quick question, I would say I was born March the seventeenth, eighteen, uh, given his mm -hmm. his uh, correct age. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came out of the service, instead of it being a, an, an asset, it was a hindrance because I then became. Uh, affiliated with the fire department, finally went up to be a deputy chief. They jumped me four times, I would have been chief, but political, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I started a credit union, and I tried to start it in 1927. It's now, they're going up another floor, 
on this structure, and it's a multi-million dollar affair. My name is on a bronze plaque in the lobby mm -hmm. as the originator of the start. I was president for 28 years, mm -hmm. and uh, of course that brought me in. I was uh, a president of the Chevrolet Group uh, Associates. We bought uh, TVs and radios and such for the prisoners, mm -hmm. and bought the uh, greenhouse and uh, try to get them on the right track so that when they went out into everyday life, they'd have uh, sort of either a hobby or uh, uh, something they could fall back on to go to work at that, uh, what training they did get there in the uh, House of Correction. Mm -hmm. So I retired at, uh, at, well, it was mandatory, uh, uh, retirement at, uh, in 64. I, I was 65 and I had to retire when I reached 65. So. I'm out 20 some odd years now. And mm -hmm. I'm still gung ho fire department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, I was one of the originators of a drill master, state drill master. And I uh, went and took courses, workshop, and forums and such. And I finally uh, uh, was assigned to uh, be with the Department of Education. And uh, I would take the uh, they, the state had a um, unit that everybody that produced some product pertaining to fire department ethics, uh, they would put that on that uh, truck that would maybe be the first one of its kind. Mm -hmm. And we fellows would go and do our homework first and then go out and demonstrate and so forth. And, and I'd go all over the state with that truck, chemical fires and uh, you name it, and I'd, I'd do it. When, when you went into the, to the Navy, what was the first ship you were on, and, and how, what condition was it in when you saw it? The, it, was, uh, it was the USS Virginia, and it was a, a, being in the Navy Yard really to be um, scrapped, but they turned around and they then gave it cosmic uh, treatment and uh, rebuffed it, and uh, in due time, it went from the USS Virginia, an old uh, type ship, uh, ready for the scrap pile. They turned it and they waved a wand and they said, you are now a light cruiser. So under that provision, we made all of these convoys. and We had uh, two or three alerts uh, up and around Iceland. We're coming back the Great Circle, swinging on down. And uh, sometimes we'd come back the Great Circle, and on other trips we'd come back south, almost down to Africa, mm -hmm. drop them off and go down and come back that way. But uh, it was a great old ship. But, uh, I have a picture of it home, and uh, all of the crew at that time. Uh, we were supposed to have a crew of not over 750, but every time we hit Norfolk, we'd pick up a group of 50 more. That meant 50 more hammocks to be slung and 50 more people to be fed. And when everything was all said and done, the influx of all of these uh, fellows, we were, ha instead of 750, we doubled. We had 1,500, mm -hmm. which caused some concern about food and well, just a, a, a thing was just so. Oh, and then on top of that, uh, they were then putting uh, guns on the uh, the bow and stern of these merchant marine vessels, and they stole some of our, took the guns from us so that they could, they could train. And then all through the night and day, going over and coming back and in port, they were uh, training these uh, fellas on using the guns on our ship. Hmm. Elevation, depression, and all this all through the night, 24 hours a day. Hmm. And then they take those men and that gun and assign that to some merchant marine. They were stripping us, stripping us down, but giving us convoy duty, and uh, we'd have to throw snowballs or something. <laughs> uh, but all in all, I'm, I still have my honorable discharge all framed there. I'm proud of it. Proud of everything that ever happened. That uh, so then finally, when I did get out of the service, I've been. Uh, 1937, 38. I was uh, past command. I'm now past commander. I'm the oldest living past commander in our post. And they give me. You think I was a crow to gear or a medal of honor man? They give me that. You know, they have a party for me. I'll be having a 
uh, my 89th birthday in uh, October, and they'll maybe have a birthday party for me and such as the, my post. But that's the VFW. I'm a charter member in the American Legion. Um, at present, I'm the, um, for respect, I believe, World War I. There's not too many of us. And they gave me the job of being the uh, uh, personal uh, representative for the group. And uh, I'm there, uh, the 18th of every month, I'm right there, and I have all of these bits that I bring and introduce about Jane Fonda and the, anything that pertains to veterans in the military. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of training did you have when you first went into the Navy? Like the clothing. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, they didn't show us the right or wrong end of a gun or anything. They just, uh, it, it was uh, so much that it was almost like a stampede. Uh, when they, when they finally uh, uh, got the thing partially started, it was much too much. And uh, they didn't have the instructors uh, such as they have today, the spin-offs from the uh, Marines mm -hmm. and uh, such and such, you know. So they done the best they could. But at that time, they introduced, uh, for want of something else, they introduced uh, a gun that you wound up fast, mm -hmm. and it was on a sort of a uh, revolving plate, and it threw these, um, well, I call them like mini balls, but they were steel. Mm -hmm. And they would, uh, of course, they were erratic. Uh, they could aim for you, but they'd hit over here. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it really no control over it. There was no way to direct, but it was somebody had a brainchild and got it up, and, mm -hmm. and they used that in and around the Navy Yard and wherever, I don't know, but mm -hmm. that was the only, I don't think I ever had, in all my experience, I don't think I ever had a, a rifle or a, a bit of ammunition or a armament of any kind in my hands. Mm -hmm. All he gave me was a big number two coal shovel and put as much coal as you can, <laughs> and of course, uh, as you know, uh, some of the coal at that time, they had to use what they could, and we got an awful lot of shale and uh, material. And as a young boy, I, I weighed maybe, let me say between uh, 135, 145, and to get on the end of about an eight-foot slice bar and break up those big clinkers uh, took some doing. Mm -hmm. And then you also had to uh, hit, hit the uh, edge of the door in such a way that on the big cold scoop, it fanned out to cover the, all of the great bar. Hmm. And uh, then we had a hopper in the middle of the fire room. We had uh, four fire rooms, and then we had a uh, we had the uh, triple expansion engines, uh, and they were um, single screw, of course. And I'd have to when I went in the engine room, I'd have to go and see that they were properly oiled and all of these various things, see that the dripping was not too fast, not too, not too slow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we, as I say again, we'd pull into port and they'd uh, load us with bags of coal up in, way up on the top deck. And then by degrees, they'd be put by, the, we call them the coal heavers. Mm -hmm. They would bring the bags down and dump them into a bin, which would maybe be, a, let me say, what would be equivalent to second, third floor, mm -hmm. maybe third floor anyway. And then they filter that on down until it come down into the uh, into the fire room. Mm -hmm. But one one incident out at the Great Lakes uh, when I was there, John Philip Sousa was there, and he played uh, in the ship's uh, in front of the administration building. Every morning they'd have first called for colors, and then they'd have the uh, the colors. And he played the stars and stripes and all of these striking military um, bits of music. The admiral at that time was a man, uh, William, uh, name escaped now, but uh, he was a, a rear admiral. And right in back of the, uh, the ship store was a small, uh, like an amphitheater, a valley, and they had put seats on the side. And on the one side was a small cemetery. Do, uh, Due to the flu, he lost his 12-year-old daughter. And they gave her a full military burial. Hmm. And uh, they buried her in that small lot 
right in back of the ship store, the main hospital ship store, mm -hmm. right there. It, 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 very, very impressive, you know, to see her on the cakes on and, and the horses on each side, mounted horses, draw it over them. They had the full, uh, they accorded the little girl 12, 12 years old, the Admiral's daughter, they give her a full, I would say almost just, I don't know just what the full, full burial, uh, burial uh, service would be, but uh, they went as far as they could with the dear little girl, you know. I, on one occasion, I met with the doctors there and the nurses, and they, uh, the fellow that was leaving, a fellow by the name of Frank Thera, he was a fellow that I followed in his footsteps, mm -hmm. and he be, he knew he was being released from the service, so he just didn't fill the shelves up, and at that time the nurses were smoking Ramesse cigarettes and Egyptian dainties, and the men were smoking Piedmont, Sweet Capital, and uh, such and such, even as far as uh, smoking Tolstoy cigarettes, which was uh, Turkish tobacco with a... Uh, a 50% container of the Turkish tobacco, which was like uh, uh, corn silk, and then there was a tube that was supposed to filter the smoke, and, mm -hmm. even at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when these fellows were, they were going to be there, the doctors and such, and they would want certain things, and I see that they were put back on the shelf, and uh, they, they, instead of having to walk way back to the main camp, which was about a mile, mm -hmm. or foot, foot uh, uh, transportation, uh, they, they finally came and I got so friendly with a couple of the doctors, I went to one autopsy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, this was, at that time a lot of the fellows had what they call uh, impetigo. Mm -hmm. Impetigo was the, um, the fluid landing down in the base and they would take the small ribs out and put in a disc, uh, a disc like this with mm -hmm. an opening so that they could uh, either siphon out that fluid. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were trying all means to try to save these fellows, but it came on them so sudden. It was uh, apparently, I suppose, it was almost all over the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that they were charging the Germans were using germ warfare, mm -hmm. and all kinds of things with point issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me interrupt for just a sure. second here. Uh, um, they were, they were dying so fast, they piled them up like cordwood, and they couldn't keep up with the, any form of casket or box. And, uh, they were not set up for it. And uh, they had a tag uh, medium by which they hoped everything would come out right, and they would tie that tag around the fellow's big toe, one of his big toes. Mm -hmm. And if the fellow was adept at tying a knot, he the fellow got his rightful tag, mm. but if they fell, one fell off one fellow's foot, and another one, maybe in the mix-up, they got mixed up. Mm. And uh, some people maybe got their right body, and some people they just uh, got someone else's body. So these were things that uh, was overwhelming, you know, it was just to come down so fast that I came home from the Great Lakes on a uh, furlough, and I started looking around for my buddies, my pals that we had gone to high school with, and so forth and so on. And they were all, the whole family would be all wiped out. And you say, from what? From what? You know, you say, in those days, I don't think we ever thought about a bomb or anything, but mm -hmm. from what? From uh, uh, Spanish flu. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I knew it, of course, from out there, but I couldn't come home and visualize that a whole family flu. But they had to the mothers and fathers just run rampant all through the place. So was there any kind of, or what kind of measures did they take uh, at, at Great Lakes or other places you were to, to try to keep the, the disease from spreading? Well, at that time they didn't, as you have now, we have the AIDS, mm -hmm. and they'd try and their utmost. Uh, they didn't have the means of collection because people didn't have the available extra dollar that they have today. And of course, your government, uh, how deep they could get into it, I don't know. So um, the doctors were trying to do their utmost, but uh, the means of uh, medicine and supplies, instead of staying in the country, more or less, were going across. Mm -hmm. And at that, at that time, they came up, of course, with the, uh, 
penicillin, a couple of doctors in England, I guess, mm -hmm. mold, it's mold, mm -hmm. and then they had the oreomycin and uh, the such. Mm -hmm. How good they were, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was like putting a band-aid on uh, a major surgical operation, you know. They were trying, but they were not really uh, arriving at the, uh, uh, the last line or the bottom line. What, what was your sense of the, how did the, how did the people react to the, the fact that people were getting wiped out right and left like that? Well, I would say, uh, of course they played it up big in the papers, uh, almost as big as the war itself. It was horrendous, you know, uh, to think, uh, you see a, a fellow, maybe 180 pounds, and uh, he's walking around, he's, uh, he just beat out. He's just he, he's he's walking slow, but he's going fast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. he, he's aware of mm -hmm. he can't beat it. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what they ever did to with those plugs in the bag because they were I'd say they're big as a silver dollar mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. You maybe have knowledge of them. I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, they took out those bottom ribs and then they were trying everything that was humanly possible to. Mm -hmm. Uh, this autopsy I went to, the fellow took, and they wanted, of course, to do research, too, to mm -hmm. find out, put their fingers, what can they do? And he took the saw and flapped the, the whole, hinge the head, you know, and mm -hmm. threw it back. I sat off, and he says, doesn't this bother you? I said, I don't mind as long as it's somebody else's blood. <laughs> so then they, they cut him from here. We call this the Adam's apple, you know. Mm -hmm. Duck's puddle, the one mm -hmm. just below. <laughs> And they cut them all the way down. They take the intestines off and all this, and run them through. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, it was something. Of course, then a lot of your doctors also went across over to the battlefield. So these fellows possibly could have been students in some of the medical colleges, and uh, you know they're trying, striving. But uh, by the same token, uh, part, perhaps the fellow went over there. Uh, better internist or something like that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had their hands on the uh, the reins at that time as far as um, internists. Uh, they made boo-boos even before the flu. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, my friends, uh, they died of uh, peritonitis or something such. Uh, they more or less set everything down if they couldn't come up with a true reading mm -hmm. the way they can do it today, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just other people would die. Uh, not malpractice, mm -hmm. but uh, let me say misjudgment mm -hmm. on this evaluation mm -hmm. of the cause. And uh, on that token, the fellow, they haven't reached what is causing the trouble. They're working around it, but uh, eventually it will get into the territorial wall or whatever and it be, become. Uh, subject for the undertaker. Mm -hmm. But now my boy... Uh, Let me stop just a second here to turn over the tape. Sure. This is side two of the interview with Mr. Joseph E. Walsh. You, you were talking about your, your boy there. You go ahead. Huh? My oldest boy, uh, while he was in high school, uh, I would be away from home on my uh, fire duty uh, chores, and uh, at that time we put in 94 hours a week on the job. And uh, in 1927, I tried to bring in the union to regulate and get better hours, even if they had to put on a few more men and make another platoon. And it wasn't until about 1935 that we got strength enough to uh, eventually go into the National AFL-CIO and become affiliated with them and uh, from that time on we become uh, unionized. And uh, of course we had strength then and uh, we go to City Hall and nine times out of ten they say you can't beat City Hall but we would produce enough uh, voices and power to achieve our uh, points and we generally get what we went down to uh, the search for. And uh, this, uh, my 
young, my oldest boy that was with Patton, uh, while he was in school, we had no, uh, at that time we didn't know of dope. Uh, the worst thing possibly was sneaking cigarettes behind the house or something. But uh, I thought, well, I'm going to try to get him under strict discipline. He wasn't a bad boy, he was a good boy in high school, dumb pranks and things like that, we all did. But at the same time, in placing him in the National Guard, uh, later on, if you wanted to borrow my car, uh, I'd say, don't do this. And he said, oh, no, I don't want to uh, uh, have any trouble with my standing in the National Guard, which I thought was uh, reaching my point. Well, then he was with the, um, the Armory, and they trained in Quincy, and eventually, uh, uh, the whole of Massachusetts was uh, uh, put together as the Yankee Division, and then they were indoctrinated and uh, brought into the uh, National, uh, the Army in itself, the Federal Army. And he left from New York, and he went over across. He made Omaha Beach head. He was, um, he had been sent out to Hollidaysburg in Pennsylvania to become a radio man, which put him up front to radio back. And uh, he had to carry at that time one of these big guns for self-protection. So with the radio equipment and the, the big gun, I guess, I forget just what he called it, but it was a monstrous thing, way heavy in weight. Well, anyway, he went all up in through uh, Germany, saw Latin and all up in through. And they uh, <clears throat> finally, with Pat, the Spirit Army, they, he was with part of that. And they finally got up to where the uh, airborne uh, group was pinned down, General McCullough up in Bastogne. And of course there was snow on the ground and the Germans were all dressed in white, hard to, uh, to be seen, you know, they were good camouflage. But Patton turned his arm, his tank, a uh, uh, company around, and they went up and they freed, uh, I, under part of his leadership, or under his leadership, they, uh, they finally freed that uh, airborne group. And, uh, of course, my boy, we've been over to Bastogne, we've been over there, and I've been uh, stayed in Munich, and then my boy couldn't make the trip that year, so I wanted to go down to Salzburg, where he had been all up into Salzburg, Bavaria. So, uh, at the Hotel Regina in Munich, I asked the fellow, I said, how could I get to Salzburg? And uh, he said, I have a Volkswagen van. So I got four other fellows and myself that about the capacity of. So we went down over the Autobahn Highway, built for military heavy duty uh, plaza. And we went down into Salzburg, home of Mozart, and uh, the beautiful horses, those uh, similar to our modern horses. And, uh, in fact, uh, the next trip I made down in through there, my my, bo my youngest boy was a state trooper, Massachusetts state trooper, and he, uh, uh, I got him in the gun business, uh, selling and buying and selling guns, swords and such, and he uh, went into the, and got into the state police, and uh, finally he finished up in ballistic due to his uh, knowledge of guns and firearms. And at that time they were, uh, in Boston, they were t had two gangs that were fighting, the McClays and the McLaughlins. There was 18 deaths. And when they recovered the bullet, uh, I would go in with them and he'd show me how they'd spin it. And then they had a barrel with the uh, cotton batten and they'd fire, take the gun, similar to the one that would have fired that bullet and they take that and fire that in, and then they calibrate it and all of this, and they put that uh, research, they put over, if they couldn't just come up with the, the death of the, the sailor at the time, they had that in the memory bank, you might say. And uh, even in one case he showed me where a man had buried his wife, as a contract, buried his wife in a town called Situate, and he had another girlfriend, and. He buried this girl in a sort of a, 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 a ravine and then filled it with gravel. But she wasn't dead. And she worked her hand up. And 
he said she did, he didn't know where she went, maybe run away with another man or something like that. They still have that her hand. He says she's still alive. I know if he's alive now or not. He done time. Him. But they cut her hand off and they have it in a preservative. If ever, I suppose they have taken the fingerprints, you know. But all of these little incidents were most gratifying. Well then, my boy left the, uh, he went to work for Smith and Watson. Worked for them for quite a while. As I say, he went to work. They come down from Smith and Wesson, and they wanted to know if he would go to work with them. So he left his time and everything with the state police. Uh, he didn't put in for a pension or anything. Go to work with them. He went in and, and uh, they went to the uh, Smith and Wesson on the road. Yeah, right. He didn't put him for the picture. Right. He went in and he went in uh, and he could change when she is with the rest uh, on the road. All of their right. police department, which I traveled with the factory representative on. And he went in New Hampshire. He could change. And he had to talk uh, down the coat. All of these police department. 38 cars with him. And he went in and he went in and he could change when she is with the rest on the road. All of their right. police department, which I traveled with the factory representative on. And he went in and he went in and he could change. And he had to talk down the coat. All of these police department. 38 cars with him. To bring out not the bad things, but the good points. How well he gets manufactured us.
with the USS Virginia on it. And the minute I pulled into the Great Lakes, these fellows were all fellows that were there, but they were not going to move. You were always Virginia on it, closing down the minute. So uh, the fellow that was there, a couple of the officers that were, well, that I would go around inspecting them. The world of sword and the white clocks and everything. The next time we take this inspection, you better be out of that kind of clock. They said, or else you'll go up and report. I, I know I'm already shot time. Mm -hmm. May we never meet him again, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, after a while, I said to the, uh, the lieutenant in charge of the ship stores, there's 20, as you know, one. all named after admirals, Camp Decatur, Camp Farragut, all of these all get one name. And as I say, at that time, uh, John Philip Sue was out there. Wait till we see him in the morning in the his walk up the first colors and in the parade ground, you know. We had yeoman Epps out there at that time. Women, oh, yeoman Epps. Yeoman. And then they put the F meaning female. Yeah. Never heard that. Epps. Yeah. This is the, how they had the distinction, you know. Oh, and then there was uh, the nurses, there was one nurse there, and her name was Brady, where she was not I was only a kid, you know. <laughs> she, uh, she was very nice. Enough to go out with her, because she was a little too top hat for me, and we got some money, and then what the hell was I making? <laughs> so we're, some fellas are also making it an hour and a half, you know, where they to go, and the hell was I breaking? She, uh, she told me, she said, I'm sorry, I'm going to help you, but she said, bear in mind, I'm not a pregnant. Which is, what the hell is it? And I'm not, oh, I'm into that. Uh, I was uh, in, in uh, on uh, Wilson Avenue, Mich no, Bush, Mich uh, Michigan Boulevard. Uh, I could go and come, nobody checked on me. I could go every weekend. I could Wilson Avenue. I had a color of work, and so for me, they did the work. I just did the... Uh, Say a physical inventory, I pull a physical inventory. I had a friend over in the main camp, he said, you're ready for an inspection. See, so I, I keep full boxes of cigarettes, and full boxes of everything, and just keep pushing one box, so that all I could do is run through it my physical, you know. And they never called for me to check, they never called for me. It was like a phantom. And I could have no rocky, received, could no shit. All of that way, that way. The next week I go down the other way, down to Fort Sheridan and down and into the loop. And I went to, at that time Al Capone was running wild out there. And I, I went, no one following, I used to, I went to uh, Big Jim Colissimo's uh, Four Deuces on Van Buren School. And she finally had, I went and met you, the auditorial. Uh, four dudes on Diamond Jim was a big fella, about six foot four, big, expensive man. And he had diamond as big as a thumbnail. And they called him Swipe for uh, the kiss, the kiss of Death. And she brought Johnny Cronio from Brooklyn, New York. So he gummed uh, Alyssa Mo down. He shot him. She won the she won the double to the took the, the four deuces. And then I was in uh, O'Banion's uh, well, club, the that one was a gangster. Uh, the gangster that gave him all the fur. And I was in uh, O'Banion's uh, I'll tell you, uh, another time I went into a place and it, uh, I don't know what the hell he called it out there, but in the Scully Square where we were used to all you know, uh, there was a place they called it Inky Dinks. And there were the uh, three point five beer, you know, beer beer uh, called it. And he could he could go to his bar and they give you the drink in a tin five cup beer beer they call it. The rail is charged. And there's buttons here on the bar. And he'd cut see to it that that tin cup went on that bunch of and then he'd throw a switch and you put your foot here. Or even if you didn't, uh, eventually you would. The minute you went to pick up that glass of beer, beer, that not a glass of kid, boom, and a bitch was shot, a mile shot, you know, just an hour. Then you went to go to the men's room, glass, he'd pull around that, not a glass, seven steps, you got a ram, got a shot, a mile shot. And then he had snakes after drinking our stuff, this is what you see, pink yellow, seven steps, he'd pull around. 